Hi, everyone. Welcome to the January 23rd edition of the Timeform US Pacecast. I'm David Aragona, and back with my usual co host, Craig Mokowski. Craig, I know we missed you last week, only putting out uh, one podcast, but I was happy to have Marcus on. Marcus always offers such great insight when we handicap those fairgrounds cards. And even though it turned out to be a chalky sequence and some of our long shot ideas uh, didn't turn out to be uh, particularly useful, I still had a lot of fun talking about it and handicapping those races with Marcus. But, Craig, Happy to have you back this weekend. It's a pretty short rundown for us to go through with all of the cancellations from last weekend. Yeah, it's funny. I joked on uh, Twitter or the X, I guess, these days about how uh, the one week I, I can't make the forecast, I actually hit the pick five. But of course, it was a joke. Uh, a few people took it the wrong way. It paid $86. I think I, I played a $24 ticket. So it was good. And, and yeah, I listen to you guys. I always enjoy Marcus when he fills in for you. And I always listen when he fills in for me as well. So uh, I think it was a really good day of racing at the fairgrounds and uh, looking forward to talking about it. Well, we've got a fun week on tap coming up, uh, Craig. That Pegasus World Cup card is already drawn. Uh, I know that we'll be doing some stakes previews around that. Uh, I think we'll be putting out four stakes videos that you can find on the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel, or I should say our excellent video producers will be putting them out. We'll just be uh, talking about them. Uh, and then we'll also be doing a forecast uh, later in the week focusing on the Pegasus World Cup day, uh, late pick five sequence. And Craig, I've started to handicap it a little bit. I uh spent a, a good chunk of time just handicapping the Pegasus World Cup last night. Maybe it doesn't have the star power that we usually expect in that kind of race, but it's definitely a fun one to handicap. It is for sure. We've talked about that in the past. Well, sometimes when you don't get the stars, it makes for better betting. And I think that is certainly the case on the Pegasus card. I mean, you could argue that the turf race has some stars in it and is actually the headliner this year. I wouldn't argue with anybody that said that, but they're all good betting races. We did some previews that aren't in the pick five. Uh, the, the late pick five looks strong. So it is a card I, I'm actually very much looking forward to. And speaking of the Pegasus World Cup coming up this weekend, we want to make you aware of this message from First Racing. Uh, Horse Racing's most player-friendly handicapping tournament, the Pegasus World Cup Betting Championship, is back on Pegasus World Cup Day, Saturday, January 27th. What makes it so great? Well, First is seeding the prize pool with $50,000 of their own cash and of your $6,000 buy-in, $5,000 is your live tournament bankroll, while just $1,000 goes towards the prizes. That means more money for you to use to rocket to the top of the leaderboard. And with 200 players participating, you're looking at a prize pool of $250,000. As for the prizes, we're talking huge stacks of cash, plus BCBC seats, NHC seats, and seats to the new and improved Ultimate Betting Ch Challenge. You can play in the Pegasus World Cup Betting Championship online at ExpressBet or on track at Gulfstream Park or Santa Anita. Think you have what it takes? Head over to pwcbc.com for registration and more information. And Craig, we'll be looking forward to everything going on around the Pegs World Cup later in the week. But for this podcast, we are going to be looking backwards at some of the races that happened last weekend and really focusing primarily on that card at Fairgrounds. There were plenty of stakes event, a lot of interesting performances from the three-year-olds in particular. And we're going to talk about quite a few of them, beginning with the grade three LeCompte, which which was the feature race at Fairgrounds on Saturday. And Craig, the winner of this race, Track Phantom, he has just been your typical Steve Asperson trainee coming along, getting his experience and racing in, running basically like clockwork every four weeks and just improving gradually with each start. He has. Uh, he's improved this time for him, uh, U.S. speed figure three, four times in a row. I forget what it is now. Uh, this time he didn't. He took a small regression. He had run a 114 winning that gun runner stakes last time. He got a 110 for this effort. Uh, Basically shook off the same rival in Nash this time, uh, a horse who was able to run second, but good strong effort. I mean, I, I don't want to knock the speed figure too much, but I don't want to get too excited about it because the, these horses have a ways to go to catch up to some of the figures we've already seen from horses uh, running as two-year-olds. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the positive to take away from this race is that you definitely get the sense this is a a pretty hardy sound horse. I mean, like I said, he debuted at the beginning of October and he has now run five times since then, uh, really just never missing a beat. And you like to see that. And Steve Asmussen's already talking about running back in the Risen Star next month. Typically, uh, these days, it feels like when uh, Connections get some points in a January prep, they're waiting until March or April to run again. But that's really not Steve Asmussen's MO. So I think we're going to see some more of track fans and moving down the Kentucky Derby Trail. Can he get a little faster? We'll see. I mean, we have seen the horses from this barn progressively get faster with experience, and he's going to need to. But what I will say, Craig, is I'm not that surprised that he took a bit of a step backwards from a speed figure standpoint off the gun runner because that was a big step forward for him. And also that felt like a much more taxing race than this one. Yeah, I would agree with that. He had an easier race this time. Um he was all alone basically the whole way around the track, uh, pressed a little bit by Nash, but he could never draw alongside of them. Um, they're both good Colts. Don't get me wrong. And there's certainly room to improve. I don't want to, to judge horses on speed figures. They earn in January. If we're talking about the Kentucky Derby, they both have quality, but it just, I wanted to make it clear. It wasn't the fastest race we're going to see. Yeah, and to be specific, uh, Track Phantom got a 114 time form U.S. speed figure for that gun runner and a 110 time form U.S. speed figure for the Lecompte on Saturday. So a slight step backwards, but as I was alluding to, that gun runner featured a much faster pace than he encountered uh, this past Saturday. So nice to see that he can adapt to different kinds of uh, situations and definitely didn't seem like he was fully extended to win this race. As for Nash, Craig, starting to feel like that big impressive maiden win may have been a little bit of a fluke because he really hasn't gone forward in two subsequent route attempts and i'm wondering if this might be a horse with some distance limitations i wonder that myself i mean he would he did break his maiden around two turns at churchill um that race has come back pretty strong it's not one that i would say oh the speed figure was wrong but hard to say maybe it just took a little out of him maybe he was just really cranked that day because he hasn't if anything he's regressed a little bit he had things his own way that day when he broke his maiden i think it was the day we had coded as kind of speed favoring so maybe he was not quite as good as he looked that day but he still was a horse with some talent. Well, we don't have to feel too bad for the Brad Cox stable because they did take home a couple of stakes on this Saturday card, including the other stakes for three-year-olds, the Phillies in the Silver Bullet Day, and West Omaha, just a dominant winner of this race. Not as fast as some of the other three-year-old routes on this card for the males. I think that's a pattern that we've continued to see since last year, just the females in this two-year-old, now three-year-old division running significantly slower than their male counterparts. But West Omaha was a decisive winner of this race, Craig. I mean, she finally ran a more complete race than I think we had seen from her in prior starts. She's this filly that runs with her head held pretty high, but she still kind of has this, this long bounding stride to her. Just hasn't seemed like she's run a complete race until now, uh, just much more in the bridle most of the way and then really finished it off the way that Luis Saez wanted her to. And she was far superior to her rivals on this occasion. We'll see if she can take that speed figure step forward in the future. Right. She's going to need to. And maybe Pace had something to do with it. It was a very slow opening quarter at 2463. Um, and as a horse who comes from off the pace a, a bit, that's really going to make it tough for her to run a great speed figure. The final time figure was a 101, uh, the overall figure in 99. So again, not the fastest race. There was an allowance race for three-year-old fillies earlier on the card at the same exact distance that actually went just a little bit faster got the same speed figure in 99. So the, these are not Phillies I'm overly excited about at this point. And let's stick with the three-year-olds for now before we get to the rest of the stakes action and discuss uh, arguably the fastest three-year-old performance on Saturday or really anywhere this weekend turned in by Hall of Fame in the fifth race at Fairgrounds on Saturday. This one going the mile in the 16th distance on the dirt, uh, same uh, configuration as the Lecompte. And Craig, this horse faced a much faster pace situation than we really saw in any of the other dirt routes on this card. And I thought showed quite a bit of stamina to put the amount of distance between himself and the rest of the field that he did uh, coming to the mid stretch marker and then just coasting into the finish. 
This was impressive. I didn't see it live. I had to go back and watch it. I saw you make a comment about it and saw some others talking about it. And wow, it, it was impressive. As you said, all the fractions are coated in red. It was a really fast pace. He was right up on that pace by the time they got to the half mile part uh, pole and just blew them away from there recording a, a just crazy 121 time form us speed figure the final time figure was a, a 114 uh, so it did get increased quite a bit by pace i i saw the buyer figure i think was right in line with this one so there's not a whole lot of argument among the figure makers at least at drf that this was just a, a really fast race yeah and that seven point pace upgrade is really as high as you're going to see for a winner of a dirt route. I mean, you, you rarely see pace upgrades in dirt routes that are quite as high as we get in the dirt sprints because uh, typically pace, uh, the impact is a little bit lessened the farther you go. And I, I know you build that into the speed figure al algorithm, Craig, uh, but this horse, I mean, just watching the way that this race unfolded, uh, three horses went out and really put some distance between themselves and the rest of the competition moving around the clubhouse turn and onto the back stretch and hollow of fame came under some pressure past the half mile pole to go after the leader funny flame and for a good portion of the far turn it looked like funny flame was actually going better than hall of fame who uh, joel rosario elected to try to go inside of that pace setting rival and it looked like hall of fame was for a good furlong a little reluctant to go through that hole but once he sort of got up in there within like the span of a furlong, he put about eight lengths between himself and that horse who just completely fell apart at the end of the race. And, and you could look in the Time Form US chart or the DRF chart to see uh, you know, where these other speed horses finished. They were beaten, you know, nearly 20 lengths or uh, well over 20 lengths in the case of uh, his uh, Steve Asperson trained stable mate who finished far back in the pack. I mean, the other horses that were chasing that pace just completely fell apart. And uh, this horse finished with some really good power through the finish line. Steve Asperson sounds like he's pretty high on this one uh already has mentioned that they're likely to go in the risen star next and that could set up an interesting matchup between this horse and the winner of the lecomte for sure i mean i would take this horse based off of what i saw on saturday particularly he was able to to track off the pace a little bit something we haven't really seen from the winner of the lecomte yet so just a, a really good race. It's funny. You mentioned Funny Flame. It's not like he was some wild long shot in here. He was the second choice coming in off a triple digit time form US speed figure that he had run back in December. And he just, I mean, he, he put that horse away. Like you said, he wound up being beaten. I think it was almost 20 lengths in there. So just a really good effort. You hope it didn't take too much out of him. Uh, he is still, I mean, it was just his second start. So I think that's something to be a little bit leery of. But as you noted earlier, Steve Asmussen, he's not afraid to run his horses. And if he sends them right back, uh, I think he'll be ready to go. Yeah, and this horse clearly was showing something in the morning. I mean, the word was out about this horse. His debut was fairly unremarkable. I mean, it wasn't the strongest race, and he earned a pretty ordinary speed figure, but that was going a one-turn seven furlongs, and he obviously appreciated the stretch out and distance. He's got plenty of stamina in his pedigree. Actually, when you look at his pedigree, it's a, a little bit unusual. He's he's very closely inbred to Giants Causeway. Uh, both his sire Gunrunner and his dam uh, are out of Giants Causeway Dam. So he's inbred, uh, you know, the pedigree uh, you know, experts would say he's inbred three by two to Giants Causeway, which is a very close inbreeding to, to, to a sire or dam. But uh, clearly this horse has quite a bit of talent. So we'll see if he can uh, continue this development when he moves up into Stakes Company. Let's move on to uh, the other uh, dirt route stakes that we'll talk about on this card, and that was for the older horses, the Grade 3 Louisiana stakes, and this produced the fastest speed figure that we saw on Saturday and really the fastest speed figure of the weekend, unsurprisingly earned by the heavy favorite Saudi Crown, who uh, was reportedly prepping for the Saudi Cup, and if this was supposed to be a prep race, Craig, I think the connections got everything out of it that they were hoping. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he looked very good. Uh, he didn't get challenged early, which I think was a little bit surprising. There did seem to be a little bit other speed in the race, but I'm not sure it would have mattered as easily as he won. He wound up with a 125 time form US speed figure, which is right in line what we saw in his better efforts last year, where he was consistently in those mid 20s and should set him up nicely for a trip over to Riyadh, I believe it is. 
Yeah, I saw some people were a little uh, uh, surprised that Five Star General didn't go on some mission to to try to run Saudi Crown into the ground. But I mean, I think we've got to be realistic about the kind of horse that Five Star General is. I mean, he was never winning this race if he was really going to go on a mission after Saudi Crown. Maybe he would have been doing a, a service to the other horses in the race, but I don't think his connections have any obligation to do that. So um Probably not a big surprise that you know that horse didn't go after uh, the heavy favorite in the early stages. And when you don't get a large field and you only have one other speed horse, you often find yourself in this situation where uh, the horse that is the fastest early just gets to dominate on the front end. And that's what happened. But the big story of this race, Craig, was just the no-show from Smile Happy, who was the second choice in here. And it just feels like whatever mental issues are plaguing this horse have just completely derailed his career. Yeah, and he's got a lot of gaps in his PPs just throughout. Uh, he's never been a, a horse that's just, I mean, he well, usually when he runs, he puts races together, but he had a couple big red lines in there. And he, this is the first time he hasn't come back from one of those layoffs. Good. He won easily for as a first time starter, won his return late race at Oakland with nice speed figures. So I do think there's a, a little bit to be concerned about. Uh, the one horse that, that I really noticed um, that I was kind of impressed with was red route one not so much his speed figure and it's not like he came close to the winner but he was actually up pretty close this time something we really haven't seen from him before so i thought that was a positive sign he's been a horse who just drops right out to the back every time he runs so maybe that change in running style could help him a little bit i mean he's a horse who always runs well but very rarely finds the winner circle so good good to see that early speed from him in my opinion yeah, part of that, a function of the pace. But uh, yeah, he is a horse that could really lose contact with the fields early. So he did show some better tactical speed here. And I guess somebody had to finish second. I mean, he and the rest were really not in the same league as Saudi crowd on this day. And as for Smile Happy, I mean, I, I hope that they can figure out what's wrong and get him back into a competitive mindset. But those uh, those concerning antics that we saw before the Stephen Foster, where he was refusing to go to the gate and freezing. We saw a little bit of that prior to this race, freezing in front of the starting gate, refusing to go in, unable to give him a proper warm up because they didn't want to get him too far away from the gate. I mean, just there are clearly some some mental issues going on with this horse that are not uh, uh, not conducive to him performing in the afternoon. So uh, we'll see if they can get over that in the future, but definitely not the way they want to start off his five year old campaign. Let's talk about another stakes from this Saturday card. Much earlier in the day, they ran the Duncan Kenner. This one, a five and a half furlong turf sprint. And another small field here, Craig. And the horse that uh, went off as the heavy favorite that I think most expected to just dominate on the front end was Just Might. And he nearly pulled it off, leading until the final furlong, but just got nailed on the wire by Sosua Summer, who typically is more of a closer, but was kept a bit closer to the pace here by Luis Saez. I was impressed with Sasua Summer just for the reason you mentioned. Uh, he usually comes from further back when he uh, ran second to Just Might last time in the uh, Richard Scherer Memorial. Uh, he was uh, a length back, but he came from way back in that field. And this time he was the horse doing the chasing, a position that's usually not all that enviable when you're chasing a lone front runner, particularly one as solid as just might but i would say just might ran his race i mean he ran a 119 speed figure setting that pace but uh, so sua summer was able to reel him in he got a 118 for the win and his two races this year have been his two best uh not surprising for a five-year-old on the turf so he seems to be moving in the right direction and i wouldn't be surprised if he takes another step forward yeah, personally, I was never this horse's biggest fan, even when he was running against Allowance Company in New York. But uh, it certainly seems like he's taken a step forward since then, and he's gotten a little bit older now in his uh, five-year-old season. Uh, just might really didn't have much of an excuse in this race, Craig. But what I will say is sometimes in these smaller fields, the pace advantage that we see on paper is a little bit mitigated because the closers are just brought into the race a little bit more, especially when the front runners don't get to create that separation with the rest of the field. A horse like Sasua Summer, we know he can finish, and when he just has a length and a half to make up on the leader in the late stages, that's a little bit easier than when you've got a nine-horse field and you've got a pass five in the final furlong. Um, I, I think sometimes uh, these pace situations... Uh, they might look pretty clear cut on paper, but the closers can have a better chance when there just aren't the, the as many rivals to, to pick their way through in the stretch. 
Yeah, no doubt. That's a really good point that you make. Uh, part of the advantage of being a front runner is you don't have to deal with traffic. And when that traffic is late, re greatly reduced as it was in a five horse field here, it certainly makes things easier for those coming from behind. And so Sua Summer took full advantage. Uh, another turf stakes later in the day at fairgrounds. The 11th race was the Colonel ER Bradley. This one going a mile on the 16th for the older horses and nice battle to the wire here between strong quality and beatbox. These two really put on a show through the stretch. Um, the stewards chose not to look at it. Craig, it probably was a little bit of hurting through the lane uh, from uh, Florent Giroux on strong quality. He was drifting out quite a bit, especially from the, the turn all the way to the finish line. I think a lot of the drifting had been coming off the far turn where uh, the stewards can't really adjudicate it. Uh, but uh, this horse did dig in very gamely to the finish line to hold off beatbox. Yeah, this was one I was hoping this could have probably doubled the price of my big pick five on Saturday. Uh, these were the two horses that I used. Uh, it was virtually a match race all the way around. And they both ran well, getting 121 time form U.S. speed figures. Big gap back to everybody else. Uh, I think these two are, are really solid turf horses that could, I, I don't think they're grade one horses or anything, but they could certainly move up into a grade three or so and run well. And strong quality is always dangerous as a horse who just makes the lead quite a bit almost every time he runs. And he's also shown he can run on dirt, having run some really big speed figures the last couple of times out on that surface as well. Yeah, the older male turf division is definitely in flux right now. I mean, unfortunately, uh, this race uh, missed the presence of uh, the old faded two Emmys, uh, who Marks and I talked about on the podcast last week. Such a an unfortunate situation, what happened with him. And uh, as far as the, the rest of the division goes in other parts of the country, I mean, up to the mark retired last year and uh, some others. Uh, we're going to see run of the Pegasus World Cup turf. I think we'll learn more about the top players in this division next Saturday. Uh, but uh, feels like this older turf division is pretty open right now. So you want to pay attention to some of these horses that might be moving up in the right direction. But uh, I think strong quality and beatbox are going to face some tougher competition down the line. And then we'll uh, talk about one more race from the fairgrounds, also on the turf, an allowance race that uh, was run right in the middle of this card. I think it was race seven, uh, won by Chasing the Crown, a Mike Maker trainee. Craig, I've got a bit of an affinity for this horse. I mean, he just tries really hard every time. Doesn't necessarily win that often, but he's often right there in the mix uh, against strong competition. He's been facing some high-level allowance competition for the past few months now. I might also like him because uh, he's one of those rare horses from the skip away sire line. That horse is always a favorite of mine, but um, he got a good trip on this occasion uh, from Joel Rosario, who just saved all the ground on the turn and angled him out with plenty of time in the stretch. Yeah, it's uh, cool that you said that. I'm a big skip away fan myself. I actually got to meet that horse at one time uh, back in my youth. So yeah, big uh, big fan of that one. And I wanted to include this because he ran a fast race. I mean, yeah, he was three to five in here. It probably wasn't the strongest field, but he ran basically the same race as they did in the stakes race, albeit at a little bit of a shorter distance. But Good, strong effort from him, and as good as he's been, uh, this 120 probably has him moving in the right direction. Uh, certainly seems like he could be competitive in stakes races. Yeah, he's, he's a horse that uh, is a five-year-old. I mean, a relatively lightly raced five-year-old, but he's been running some nice speed figures for a while now, so we'll see if he can make that transition into stakes company. Let's move on to Santa Anita, and we're just going to talk about a couple of races there, and that'll really be it for the podcast. There just wasn't a whole lot to put on the rundown this week due to all of those cancellations. But both of these races, I think, worth discussing at Santa Anita, Craig. The feature race there on Saturday was the Grade 3 La Cañada, and nice to see Desert Dawn finally get back to the winner's circle. She's sort of been knocking at the door at the upper levels of this division for the past couple of years. I think she's placed in three Grade 1 races since her last victory, and that prior victory come all the way back in the spring of 2022 when she won the Santa Anita Oaks as a three-year-old. Now she's a five-year-old, but uh, was able to get the job done here as uh, the second choice under a nice ride from Fluffy and Pratt. It was a nice ride, and it's another case. It was just five horses. Maybe that helped her out a little bit as a closer, though. Uh, you know, she's been in short fields before. Uh, this is a filly, or I guess is she a mayor now, uh, newly turned mayor, who 
I mean, she only lost the Breeders' Cup this staff by a length and a quarter, even though she finished fifth. She seems to just always show up. She always runs her race. She runs time form U.S. speed figure somewhere between the 110 and 115 mark. Uh, she got a 112 for this effort and was just able to, I mean, she really never looked like a loser as they went into the uh, final turn. Um, just looked like she had the race, and, and she did. She won it really easily, I thought. Uh, not the strongest company. It, it was a grade three. I'd say it was at best a grade three level field. And I'm with you. It was kind of more a feel good. Just good to see her get a win because it has been a while. Yeah, a nice effort from the runner up here, Coffee in Bed, uh, a Richard Mandela trainee who's a little bit less exposed than the others in here. She hasn't had as much dirt route experience and definitely took a step forward here, getting back on the main track. I thought she finished nicely. And we definitely need some new faces in this older Philly and Mare Dirt division out in California. So uh, hopefully she can continue progressing. Uh, as for the other race that we'll talk about from Santa Anita on Saturday, it was the first race of the day. This one got some people uh, chattering on social media, predictably, given uh, the way that uh, this debut winner achieved his win. Uh, that was uh, May Moon, who was a $900,000 two-year-old purchase after working a furlong in a mind-boggling nine and three-fifths last April at OBS. Um, sold for that huge sum of money and made his debut uh, very early in his three-year-old season here about nine months later for trader Bob Baffert and did what I think we'd expect to see for a horse with those credentials and coming in with the hype that he did, uh, got to the front and just widened every step of the way in fast time. Yeah, it was an impressive performance for sure. There were plenty sprints on the day, so making the speed figure was no issue. He wound up with a 113 time form US. Final time was a 110. So good effort by him. I think what was most impressive, there were a couple horses coming in out of a fast maiden race. They had run triple digit time form US when running second and third. Uh, and he basically, those were the two chasing him, and he put them away, actually set it up for another horse to come up and pick up the pieces for second, but nobody was getting to this guy. Uh, it's hard to get too excited about the Bob Baffert horses right now because we just don't know what's going to happen with them. As of now, they can't be on the Kentucky Derby Trail. This one would have to change barns, I think, within a week. So not sure what's going to happen with them, but he certainly has some real talent. Yeah, I'm also not sure exactly what to make of, well, his horses and this horse in particular, whether he proves to be a Kentucky Derby prospect, I would personally be a little bit skeptical of that. I mean, he doesn't necessarily strike me as well, and that's going to continue getting better with that at distance. He is by Frosted, who we've seen have some success with uh, different types of runners, dirt, turf, you know, stretching into route distances a little bit, but not necessarily horses that want to go classic distances. And there really is not a whole lot of pedigree on the dam side. And the little pedigree that you can find is mostly sprint influences. So I'm I'm a little bit skeptical that this horse is going to be a derby prospect. Um, and as you were alluding to, uh, there's been some uh, <laughs> statements put out and some, uh, I, I think, uh, strategic maneuvering ahead of the end of January when these Triple Crown nominations are due. But there's been some reporting that these Bob Baffert horses might have to move to a different barn next week uh, if they want to be eligible to receive Kentucky Derby points, or I should say earn Kentucky Derby points. Um, so we'll see how that all plays out over the next several weeks. Uh, but uh, we've seen quite a few of these horses come along, Craig, and some of them have panned out after impressive debuts for the Baffert Barn at this time of year. Um, a lot of those do have those regal pedigrees that suggest they want to go longer. However, this one, not exactly in that category. So we'll see how he develops in the future. Yeah, I saw uh, our colleague Marcus talking about this when he was a little bit skeptical uh, of the breeding as well on this one, but he's certainly fast. Uh, I imagine he'll show up in a race out in California next, and he'll be one to follow, but he's going to get bet pretty heavily. So, you know, maybe based on what you guys had to say, he'll be worth taking a shot if he tries stretching out. Yeah, I mean, the thing that, that kept sticking in my mind after this race was, wow, Bob Baffert has so many good horses. He even has uh, the exceptionally talented son of Frosted. I mean, it's like nothing slips through the cracks these days. The top connections get all the best horses, even from the nondescript sires. And I think that's a big function of a lot of these horses selling at the two-year-old sales and the prolifer proliferation of horses selling at two-year-old sales over the past couple of decades. Uh, you get much more of a window into the abilities that these horses have as younger 
youngsters. And uh, the opportunities for some lower profile connections to wind up with a horse like this uh, has kind of uh, gone away. And it's uh, it's uh, led to probably a little more concentration of power of the, the major players in this sport. But that's probably a topic for another time. <laughs> yeah, that's one. Not, I don't think it's a great thing, and I imagine you don't either, but it's the ham we're dealt now as horse players, so we have to learn to deal with it. Well, Craig, that brings us to the end of the pace cast this week. Uh, we will be trying to get that Time Form US forecast out a little bit earlier than usual this week. I think we're planning to record that late on Wednesday, probably released on Thursday. So you can look forward to that. Like I said at the top of the show, uh, that'll be focusing on the Pegasus World Cup Day late pick five at Gulfstream. That naturally is an all-stake sequence that features both of those uh, Pegasus races, the Pegasus uh, grade ones, I should say, the Pegasus World Cup and the Pegasus World Cup turf. And Craig and I, like I said, we'll be doing some stakes previews for those races, uh, discussing every horse and four of the stakes races that you can find on the DRF YouTube channel. So a lot of content. Make sure you follow Daily Racing Form social media channels this week uh, to catch everything that Craig and I are putting out, as well as from our colleagues uh, Dan Illman, Mike Beer, Ashley Mayu, and everybody else who's uh, putting out content this week. Uh, a lot of good stuff on the horizon on DRF's channels. Uh, Craig, Fun to discuss these races and looking forward to getting some handicapping of the Pegasus with you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this card. Like you said, it's loaded top to bottom. So look forward to talking about it very soon and getting that content out there. Well, speaking of the Pegasus, as I said at the top of the show, I want to remind everybody that horse racing's most player-friendly handicapping tournament, the Pegasus World Cup Betting Championship, is back on Saturday, January 27th, Pegasus World Cup Day. What makes this competition so great? Well, first is seeding the prize pool with $50,000 of their own cash. And of your $6,000 buy-in, 5,000 is your live tournament bankroll, while just 1,000 goes towards the prizes. That means more money for you to use to rocket to the top of the leaderboard. And with 200 players, you're looking at a prize pool of $250,000. And as for the prizes, we're talking huge stacks of cash, plus BCBC seats, NHC seats, and seats to the new and improved Ultimate Betting Challenge. You can play in the Pegasus World Cup Betting Championship online at ExpressBet or on track at Gulfstream Park or Santa Anita. Think you have what it takes? Head over to pwcbc.com for registration and more information. Well, that's it for Craig and I on the Time Form US Pacecast this week. Remember, you can catch that Time Form US forecast coming up on Thursday. Everybody, you can always listen to these DRF podcasts on DRF.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Thanks, everybody, for listening this week. <laughs>